right. Well, and uh, by the way, it was indeed. Hold on. Let me find. I've scribbled this number down. I'm sure it will be ingrained in everybody's memory. It's in here somewhere. Where the f*** is it? God damn it. 80. Hold on. Where did I? Ah, 81,000. How many pages did you use for this? Jesus. Well, 81,035. A new world record at Wembley Stadium on August 27th for the biggest paid attendance in the history of wrestling of all time, anywhere that we have been able to verify. And all the people who aren't on the internet are going, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. They had 93,000 at WrestleMania 3 and 100,000 at WrestleMania. <laughs> AEW is announcing shoot numbers, and so many people believe the WWF's work numbers now that they sound, again, like idiots for telling the truth. You say so many people believe it. Guinness Book believed it. Yes. They, you know, and... They like they're like Trump. They just said bullshit so long that people believed it. They still do it. I mean, it's not like just for WrestleMania three. For every year's WrestleMania, we hear about what they announced, then we hear about the legitimate number, and then we hear about the comps, then we hear how many people <laughs> they think could possibly be working in the area <laughs> of the building. You know, I know Brandon Thurston at WrestleNomics just did a study attempting to count the seats at the Silver Dome based on photos to see how many could possibly have been in there, even if they sold every ticket. So there's still so many questions about that. And with All In, give Tony Khan credit. This is something to brag about. In an era where WWE is constantly announcing one record after another, AEW debuts in Europe and England with the biggest paid audience ever. And they're, according to Tony Khan at the uh, press scrum, they think it was in the neighborhood of 90,000 people overall in the building. Well, and, and again, they should have said that they should have said, we have 81,000, whatever paid. And with our comps and boxes and et cetera, the crowd is 90,000 or whatever it may have been. They couldn't get a record if they did that. I guess the record was about the paid audience. It wasn't about the overall amount of people in the building. Well, but still it's, if you've got the record for the paid audience and you've got another 10,000 people in the building, you might as well mention them too. For heaven's sake, no reason to be modest at this point, Brian. But it, the only thing I had to think when I watched this was, do you think at some point, either in the lead up to this, or if somebody makes him watch it, or at least look at a clip, if Vince says, why the fuck didn't we do this first? And then somebody would else would turn around and say, Vince, you wouldn't let us. Because they've been screaming up there a big show in England or whatever. They did the clash at the castle finally in Wales or wherever because they got a bunch of money from the the government. But they, you know, the, the reason why Vince never wanted to do pay-per-views over there because the time difference, especially WrestleMania, they always catered to the North American market. But do you think now he's thinking, well, fuck, we could have done this. Tony Khan has announced that the preliminary pay-per-view numbers were the biggest numbers in over a year. With an afternoon start time in, on the East Coast. So obviously yeah. it did not have a real negative effect, I don't think, on those pay-per-view buys. And that was, I always think, Vince's biggest concern about running the event from over there. Well, but remember this now. That's when... Pay-per-view buys were in the several hundred thousands, or five hundred thousand, or six hundred thousand, or seven hundred thousand, or whatever the fuck. Now that I mean, I'm not doubting this is Tony's biggest in a year, but even especially with Peacock, the WWE doesn't really do particularly pay-per-view numbers of any kind anymore. But we're down now to the people that are going to order the wrestling pay-per-view, or not the the people during the Attitude Era that ordered it and have 10 friends come over and get pizza. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. They're going to watch it. They're going to record it. They're going to stream it. It's down to the, what is it? A hundred thousand, 150,000 that are going to watch no matter what time it's on or what day. You know, and another thing is remember Cena just teased it just recently at that show, WrestleMania in London, WWE's already teasing, going down the path of trying to get, it's subsidized. 
which is what they do now. They have different right. towns bidding on WrestleMania, and then they get a whole bunch of breaks for it. AEW didn't have to do that, and they got upwards of 90,000 people in the building. Well, I see. And they already announced a return date for next year. Tony Khan said at the scrum afterwards, he wants this to be an annual bank holiday event in England. Okay. Uh, slow down, cowboy. I mean, you know, here's the thing. This is the first time they've ever been to the United Kingdom. Next time will be the first time in a year. You get a law of diminishing returns. This time, this was an incredible, bizarre gift that people just made a happening, made the Woodstock, as we talked about. With no card. No card. It, you know, and again, could Austin and Rock have done that 25 years ago if they'd run Wembley Stadium? Of course they could have. But this was a happening that you can't rely on to be an annual thing. I think he he should look at his... And what are the the open the tennis uh, tennis facility they got up there in New York? What is it? The Arthur, Arthur Ashe. Ash. Yeah. First year they sold it out twenty thousand. Second year they came back. Well, I think did what they do? They did ten or twelve thousand. Maybe a bit more than that, but not as much as the first night. But I understand this year they're coming back again fairly soon, and I understand they're in the single thousands. Because it it's not the first time ever anymore. It's not special anymore you have to work harder you have to have a more intriguing attraction or a better main event whatever the case and you know i think it's going to be eye-opening for tony it, that can you make money if you run wembley stadium and you draw thirty thousand or thirty five thousand? that's a third of a house can you still make a profit but here's the, the thing they don't need to make money he's pro and most of the things that have happened have happened for Tony because he doesn't need to make money for the first time in history. Somebody got into wrestling business not needing to make money. And I don't mean the guy that had six million bucks from his lottery winnings. I'm talking about that does not need to make money for years. He he got a hundred million dollars and he started a company and we've gone over it. He, because of that money and because of the connections that his dad already had, he was able to do all these things and bless him for being a promoter. He's still a lousy booker. But it it wouldn't, it won't always be this easy because you can't do things for the first time over and over. And my God, again, if anybody thinks this is specifically because of AEW and what they've done or haven't done, then just reflect on this. This your this show was bigger than Londo and Lewis, than Thez and Leone, than fucking Bruno and Zabisco, than fucking Austin and Rock, than every big major event that's ever happened when millions more people were watching wrestling than they are right now, tens of millions more. This was a fucking aberration made by current day market conditions that I don't believe you can make an annual event. Maybe I'll be wrong. Again, they I had no card. If they come back next year, they have Omega Punk. If they have Osprey in another high profile match, because the British fans liked Osprey. If they have a good card, this was a event with no card leading into it. You had to guess what it was. The matches were still coming together. Hook Jungle Boy was announced the night before on TV. So there was still stuff coming together. If you had a good card there, and people all seemed to have a real positive experience, they made a whole day out of it, obviously. Again, if they don't kill the market, it's not crazy. England's different than Queens. <laughs> <laughs> In Even a lot of ways. England has the Queen. Yes. Um, well, and that's true. And uh, again, you can look back to the 90s. When Vince's business domestically was in the toilet, they were constantly touring Germany, the UK, Kuwait, I remember. 
Uh, sometime, especially every year after WrestleMania, the guys would go over there for like a week and a half, two weeks. And sometimes they'd have two different tours in different countries at the same time. They, they plumbed that well because they, it was newer then. And the people, they were drawing thousands of people every night in these little towns in Germany or whatever, because it was novel. And that carried them over until they could get their domestic business back again. But they that's the thing with, with Vince, with the time difference and the big shows, Wembley worked out for SummerSlam 92. But now that there's, you know, less emphasis on selling to pay-per-view and more about just getting people to watch Peacock, and there's fewer people overall that are watching and more they're more motivated than ever before to watch, I, don't, I think we're going to see them do something over there as quickly as they yeah, can. I think they're going to want to be able to one-up Tony on this announcement. That's, a, that's the kind of thing that, for whatever reason, matters a lot to those guys. They're going to want to be able to announce that they have the biggest paid audience ever. Tony's coming back to Wembley next year. It's going to be very interesting. Very, I mean, he was... At the media scrum, it was a different Tony Khan. Still a little nutty, but more serious. Wearing a suit, his hair is still a mess, <clears throat> but a more serious Tony Khan, and I think a lot of it was understanding what just happened, and it is incredible what happened, and he's going to try to do it again next year, and we'll see how the British people take to it. It's going to be very interesting. Well, let's see how they took to what they did already at All In. I like that they opened the show with at least give me some reason to continue watching. If they'd opened it with some of the matches they had, I would have mentally shut down. But we got the real world championship on the line first out of the gate with Samoa Joe versus Lack Mussolini, Goozle Jack Perry. Oh. So the fans were singing. <laughs> And the big, it's clobbering time. He Punk got a big ovation. And again, you heard a lot of people singing the song because the UK wanted wants to see stars. They're deprived of the live events, as we've talked about. So they're there, the fucking atmosphere. People ready to fucking scream and yell. And they reacted to Punk. And then as soon as the match settled in, they got firmly behind Joe and started booing Punk. And it, you know, and he worked with it. I was glad to see Jim Ross on the show, and he sounded better and more energetic than we've heard him in a while. Yes, and he crapped on all the stuff I was mentally crapping on watching yes. it, and it made it made Jim Ross the highlight of the show in a lot of ways for me. Yes, because and when know, he left the show, I should have left the show. <laughs> that's that's the thing is he was you know when he'd say I never understood this when two guys are doing something completely stupid. Um. But he sounded better and more energetic. Of course, they switched out. If you're not paying attention and you miss the start of the match where they switch out the announcers, then you're disoriented because whose voice is... They had everybody on this show at one point in time. Taz was out there. JR. Sockface was all over it, and he was especially unbearable, as one would imagine, being as he was, I'm sure, creaming in his pants to actually be doing something that he's not very good at in front of that many people. But the, the, besides the, uh, Nigel's great. And plus this was his environment. Punk came out with a shaved head and the short tights. And <laughs> at the bell, there was a big chant for Samoa Joe. Uh, I'm enjoying this because I didn't know at the time I was watching the match that he had just, Punk had just had a skirmish with somebody. But it just seemed like he was having more fun with being booed even than normal. And he, when he's doing the Hogan ear cupping, and he's just giving the people the look and, and encouraging it, do you think now he was thinking, you know, I've just had another one. They'll probably start yelling at me when I go back there again, and I'll fucking go home again. So fuck it, I'm going to come out here and have fun with Samoa Joe. You think that's what was going through his mind? Again, the news was breaking as this match was happening, and I thought yeah. it was a joke at first, because I was like, no way, come on. <laughs> Can't be every year at the same weekend or the same time period every year. And I think he knew 
And I also think he's working with a guy he wants to work with, a guy he's going to enjoy working with despite getting his ass kicked in the match. And how do you not enjoy that kind of crowd reaction? And uh, there was a bit, oh, I know you love the, uh, he did the Terry Funk tribute when he got hung up in the ropes and got bounced up and down, up uh, upside down. And then Joe did the thing where he walks off on a guy that's trying to do a dive on him and got a huge pop for it and then grabbed Punk and ran his head through the front of the desk. So Punk came out bleeding and had good juice. And again, benefit of being on first before all of the indie-rific outlaw fucks get a hold of the ring and bleed for no reason that won't make any money. And then they were still having the match where Joe gets heat on Punk and Punk sells big but fights from underneath, even though Joe was the baby face for the fans. This kind of match works because Joe can't and really shouldn't sell as a baby face. And it's still Punk. It works for Punk regardless of whether the people are behind him or not when he fights from underneath in this instance against a big guy like that. So blah, blah, blah. Finally, Punk makes a comeback. He milks the ear. He hits the leg drop and gets a one count. And that was great. And then Joe starts hulking up. And the people are coming up. And they do the finger pointing. And <laughs> again, it's a little homage, a little tribute, but it wasn't over-the-top silly. I'm not sure everybody actually picked up on it. I'm sure a lot of people did. And then... Joe does the jabs, boom, 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 and the power slam, and then they're back and forth. And again, Punk does another Terry tribute with a spinning toe hold. We brought that back. And then finally, as Samoa Joe is going for the muscle buster, he nails Punk, and Punk falls to the apron. Joe tries to pick him back up to give him a superplex, but Punk foils that and hits the Pepsi plunge off the top rope, boom, one, two, three. And as soon as they hit the music, now there was a big reaction again when Punk gets his hand up. Okay, they're they're working. They're working with him through the match. We're going to boo you. We're going to cheer Joe, but we appreciated all of that, and we're glad to see everybody's here. And then they cheered, and they booed, and they sang, and they did all the things they wanted to do. But at least we started the show with a fucking wrestling match that actually had a story and an angle behind it, and there was no superfluous gaga, and it got over. What'd you think? Really good match. Can't add too much more to what you said. Really good match. I like the look of everything. The ring ropes were lighter than they usually are. The ring aprons were lighter. I watched Collision after this, and everything was so dark. I mean, obviously, they have to darken a lot of the arena because of the amount of people there, but the brightness, the changing colors, and the tones. Now, were you using products from CB Distillery at this point in time, where the, the, the colors had such richer hues, and the sound, it was so quadraphonic. And then, you know, maybe that's what it was. It wasn't that, and now we're fine friends at CB Distillery. Don't give you anything that makes you see colors, ladies and gentlemen. That's not part no, of you, the deal. You, you hear the colors. All right, well, this is you, you ought to hear blue, I'll tell you. Well, what I was going to say is I think it made a big difference, especially for a show in that building with part of the show at least being open air or partially open air. It looked more like a WrestleMania than a Dynamite. Yes, and uh, just because of the sea of people on the floor, if nothing else, because you never see that anymore. Uh, was You know, it, they were so deep and... and they was deep and wide. But anyway, so it was a, a good way to open with Punk and Joe. Where are we going to go from here? You know where we need to go from here, Brian, to match number two. And do you remember what that was? <laughs> they front-loaded the show. I remember being surprised it wasn't uh, the tag match. Yet. What was number two? Well, it was the six-man with... Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. With, uh, with you know, the, the, all the friends. You got Twinkle Toes, and you got his friend and golden lover cohort Coda Idushi, and you got a hangnail page that he's a friendly guy that takes up for his friends. I think this may have been a match where Jim Ross asked the question, why is everything golden? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know what? I guarantee you nobody has yet told Jim Ross that their tag team in Japan was called the Golden Lovers and their finish was called the Golden Shower for fear of what he might say on the air. Or he might just stand up and throw his hat yeah. down and walk out. Or he may participate in a golden shower. You never know. Hey, but anyway, uh, actually, do you know that? Actually, that was a, what? That, that was a best-selling novel. <laughs> what was? Golden Rivers by I.P. Freely, a famous author that... Uh, I thought you were going to say that, Jim Ross's Golden Showers was no, a best-seller. No, no, no. That was, that was a video. But... And then, <laughs> Mama Cornette used to say that right next to Golden Rivers by I.P. Freely was the novel Under the Bleachers by Seymour Butts. Mama so, Cornette used to say that? Mama Cornette used to say that. Hangnail Page, a douchey and twinkle toes against gin and juice and take a shit. So we didn't get gin and juice against FTR in another classic or even a banger. We got them wasted in this, and this was the start of the the modern style of wrestling. Juice Robinson is animated. He makes Twinkle Toes and Hangnail seem exciting when he's in there with them. He, it, it's movement, it's personality, it's fucking, it's sound. Different. He sa he's always now, saying something. He's always uh, antagonizing his opponents. So I just wrote down just a few highlights of this match. So a douche, stood there and let Jay White hit him 12 times with forearms that he didn't sell a one of and asked for more of them. That's where JR said, well, I never understood this because it's stupid. So nobody would. And then Jay White took a bump for one kick from old Coda. So the full-time guy gets leveled by one kick from this plump, unimpressive part-timer, but the the full-time guy can hit the part-time guy 12 times in a row, and he just, oh, give me some more. That wasn't enough. And then Twinkle Toes got in, and everything suddenly was 100 miles an hour and a lot of wasted motion. And uh, Take a Shit and uh, Ibushi then got in and traded forearms that nobody sold, and then everybody jumped in and derailed the heat that they had going on on Twinkle Toes. After his dives and everything, they stopped him. They started to get some heat on him, but then when everybody came in and started their own fight, that was useless. Knox is useless as a referee, the corpse referee. I wrote, Take a Shit is the best of every single one of their Japanese talents, and it's not even close. He's a star. I wish somebody could get him under their wing, under their booking, make him a real wrestler, Pinocchio. Uh, so then Kenny tagged Hangnail, and he made a comeback of rushed, sloppy dives, and then everybody did some more stuff. And then Kenny and Coda tried to do their stereo moonsaults, where they run to opposite sides of the ring, jump over the top rope, and flip onto... Two people that are standing there motionless watching this happen. And Coda slipped off the rope and fumbled his footing and had to do a backflip off the bottom rope, which that was interesting. And then the fans chanted, Golden Lovers. And then every babyface in the match beat up poor old Jay White by himself. And then they each started pairing off in the ring one against one to do stuff with those people while the other ones disappeared until the cue for their next move. And they were just kind of doing stuff and it went a while longer. And then Kenny hit two of the heels with knee lifts and take a shit school boy him one, two, three. That, I mean, there was really nothing, nothing else to say about it. Cause you couldn't really keep track of it. Cause it was guys doing things to each other over and over again. What'd you think? It was kind of a throwaway six-man match in a lot of ways. Kota Ibushi, this is twice now he's appeared in AEW and not appeared to be as impressive as he used to be, whether it's physique-wise or just in-ring-wise. I think it's a waste of Takeshita. He shows so much potential, and not even potential, he's really good. Just watch what he's doing in there, and he's got size and a look. I guess the one positive is he beats Kenny, so it sets him up, hopefully, for some more singles action as opposed to everything being multi-person matches juice robinson from the moment they come out there 
from the moment they're on the entranceway. And they stood there for a long time for some reason. <laughs> but when they're out there, Juice Robinson, you can't take your eyes off him. And he's screaming at you. Even his voice is distinct. And we'll see where they go with this. You know, again, I said before, we talk about Wembley next year. They sold out Wembley with no card. They continued to sell tickets with Kenny Omega being in a match that really didn't matter. I don't think anyone was really looking forward to this match. Not that there aren't good people in the match. No one was looking forward to it. And this is the former world champion. He's just in a six-man match. Maybe next year they use him better. Well, I mean, a lot of it depends on what kind of condition he's in, to be honest. I, I was about to say, maybe next year, you know, they'll, he will have uh, recouped and recovered from because he was talking about, well, I don't know how much longer I can do this, what, two or three months ago. So, but never, the, or maybe he can transition to a, a role behind the camera where we don't have to look at him or listen to him. What would a good role for him be behind the camera? Um, cameraman's stool? He could get down on his hands and knees. The cameraman could sit on his back. Anyway, so then we come to the rubber match for the AEW World Tag Team Championship, the Buckaroos versus FTR. And boy, Brian, you and I, we've this is the one we were sure of, the one we knew what was going to happen. There ain't no way that the buckaroos are going to put FTR over and do what's right for business and the biggest show of all time. They're going to have their, their wives and their kids and their uncles and their daddies and their mommies and their mistresses. And the whole family is going to be there. Everybody's going to be watching. They no way they're going to do it. They got to beat FTR. They got to rub their faces in it. And for once, Brian, for once we were, we were, re we were, re uh, we were wrong. No, we weren't. Because I said the other day, the finish changes if it's what gun. And Tony says, everyone thinks the title change is going to happen. I'm not going to lose cash because it's what gun. I'm going to put the titles on them. Obviously, well, you know, cash we was running with what gun? What gun? You know what I was going to think or what I was going to say is that I believe down deep in my heart that they were indeed going to beat FTR. But then somehow somebody close to them played them what we said and they saw the light. They reformed, Brian. They, the, the, like the Grinch, their hearts grew three sizes that day and they realized by our eloquent commentary on the matter that they would be so selfish and egotistical of them, the gall of them, and so therefore to keep the heat off of them, and because we were able to touch some human part of them down deep, way down deep, that they, they had a change of heart and a change of plans. I'd like to think that, that we brought this on by appealing to their, their humanity I don't think so. I think the bigger appeal was reality. And I think reality was pretty apparent here. One team is really hot. One team isn't. And the Bucks aren't. And beating FTR here would do more damage to FTR than it would do to help the Young Bucks. So you think maybe I think, Tony I think even they had to down. see that. I think even they had to see that. Well, but do you think maybe Tony put his foot down? And maybe that's maybe that's why the match was no better than what it was because the the Buckaroos weren't all mentally on board with it. Did you see Boo Boo Job Face as you put it? Well, it's hard to tell with their faces because they look like pricks no matter what the fuck their emotion is. So it, it but at the same time, I mean, you know, part of this could have been that I just don't think they're up to it. I don't think the Bucks are up to having a real, legitimate, professional wrestling tag team match without doing the same shit they always do and being allowed to do everything under the sun for, you know, just pop after pop after pop from people who like to see shit break and make noise. They had a bunch of their same shit in here, but I look at 
I look at FTR. They had three match of the year candidates by everybody's assessment, not just ours. With the Briscoe brothers, all three of the matches different, and all three of them took place in a goddamn barn in front of a thousand people or less. So maybe not the last one. That was on a Ring of Honor show, I think, that maybe had 2,500. And then I see that FTR had the, not just our opinion, but the consensus of many people, including even Uncle Dave, the greatest American tag team match on television of modern time or all time with gin and juice. And I hear the praise of the six-man tags they've been involved in on Collision. And I'm thinking, well, FTR and the Bucks was eh, must be the Bucks. Because you mean to tell me that if they had the match they had on collision with Gin and Juice, that a rematch in front of 80,000 people would not have been just a rip snorter. And instead we get this, and yes, FTR tried, but you've got if the Bucks can't do the same old Bucks shit and have the same old match where rules don't matter and it does nobody can follow it anyway, they can't hang. They can't have a tag team wrestling match. Their timing is shit. I'm not talking about timing on gymnastics. I'm talking about timing on getting heat and being in the right place. Their psychology is rotten. They're still visually ridiculous against two guys that look like Cash and Dax even, much less, you know, the classic teams of days gone by. Their gymnastics are perfect, but that's the same thing they always do. So I don't think they can carry it. They're, this has exposed them. When they work with teams that are much better from a fundamental level to a psychology level to a fucking execution level of the more intricate shit they they can't hang with it and you know it got tedious after a while with ftr trying to have a match and them trying to throw in the same flip over the top and yank the guy's ass and then i'm going to jump back on the apron and back flip off that they have been doing since i was having to suffer through them in ring of honor in 2012 so you know, they were they were going home. Finally, Nick took forever to superplex Dax for the deal where they do the power and glory superplex splash. Matt got hung up on a top rope. They traded spike pile drivers for two counts, uh, a bunch of false finishes. Finally, the crowd started waking up with the back and forth false finishes. And finally... FTR foiled the buckaroos and hit the shatter machine one, two, three. But I just, it's not even now me just personally being offended by the presence of Maddie and Nikki on the planet. It's that they just aren't as good as now that they may have been a lot to write home about when they started the company and everybody was just all enthralled with this whole idea of the elite. But now that they've had actual talent come in that are better, and we've seen the same old shit with no growth or exponential improvement whatsoever from the Cucamonga kids, it's kids playing. It's more obvious now. Your thoughts? The right result for a number of reasons, but the wrong match in a lot of ways. I think it was the weakest of the three matches between the Bucks and FTR, and the three matches were under very different circumstances. I did hear a lot of people in the building say that it was hotter than it appeared on TV, and that just may be a miking the crowd issue, especially in a building like that. How do you mic a crowd like that, that size of its open well, air? Well, but my eyes were working even if I couldn't hear everything, and what I saw wasn't that thrilling. You know... The fact is, we've been saying it on this show now, maybe going back to 2015, 2016, I forget what. But FTR better than the Young Bucks and the Revival were better than the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks had a lot of matches. What we've all come to know now on national TV, no rules. Tags don't matter. 
Referee just lets anything happen. Nonstop flips, go for cheap pops, keep going for those cheap pops, kick out of everything. Sell nothing. Sell nothing. Despite your size, you're as powerful as Hulk Hogan. We've seen all of this stuff now for years. When the one dipshit double Northern Lights suplexes two grown men because they let him, it's just... <sighs> but we've seen all that, and at the same time, you know, FTR and American Alpha was three matches that we saw on TV. I'm not talking about whatever they worked in small towns in Florida. Three matches. FTR and Gargano and Champa. Three matches. Not non-stop matches. And those matches were all excellent. They established themselves as being this modern standard of excellence in tag team wrestling. And you would just hear the churn from people that love the Young Bucks. And we've now seen them in the same company for years. There's no question anymore. FTR are the more talented tag team. They're the better tag team. Right now, they're the tag team the fans chose out of the two options. And the Young Bucks went with the right thing here because FTR are, are what's happening right now. People want that music to hit. It's very similar to the Midnight Express. You know, even when you guys were heels, people started looking forward to the music. People want to hear FTR's music hit, and they want them to come out there and have a great match. This match became almost a cliche at times. Just kicking out of everything. We're going to do your finishers. You do our finishers. Why? Why would anyone do any of these things? I will say one positive, and this blew me away. I could be wrong because I've talked about it on the show before. I think this is the very first time AEW has acknowledged Excalibur on commentary, and he was unbearable all night, that FTR lost the first match because Cash Wheeler, in an act of desperation, went for a 450 splash. The team of no flips, just fists went for a flip, and it cost them the match. And then they never said anything about it ever again. This is the first time on this show, because it played into something later in the match, that they mentioned it which I couldn't believe that they finally mentioned it here. I think everyone's ready for both teams to just move on and do something else. And the Young Bucks certainly come out of this cooler than they've ever been. Ever. Since they've been on the Indies. Ever since and, they left and, Impact. And not cool like Fonzie was cool. Cool like cooled off. Yeah. They haven't grown. I mean, if you've been watching AEW since the beginning, you've seen what their matches are. So then it becomes, what about the character development? They've become more childish. They've become more of a parody of wrestling. They could have leaned into it and just been great heels and gone all the way with that. But it all comes back to the silliness. It's all about them and what they want to do as opposed to what's best for the company. In this case, what was the right thing for the company was the result. Well, now we go... You, you'd never go full outlaw, Brian, but they went full outlaw. We, we've slowly been descending into madness. We had a good wrestling match to start the show, Joe and Punk. Then we had the six-man tomfoolery, but at least there, you know, there was a, an element of athleticism involved and a couple of names that you could do something with. And then FTR and the Bucks, that had to be done, I guess. But now we've gone to the point of no return. I knew we were in for problems when they announced Giovanni was sitting in to replace Jim Ross. I said, oh boy, he left for a reason. Yeah, they, he didn't want to get any of this on him. Not only did they do a football field fuckery match, but they did it with literal job guys, literal preliminary talent in a gimmick match where anything's supposed to be legal. Now tell me, Brian. I double dog dare you. Tell me who was on what team. Who wrestled this fucking thing? Okay, I could do this. The BCC, so that's Yuta, Moxley, and Claudio. And they're not proud and powerful anymore. Just Mike Santana and Ortiz against the best friends, Pockets, Eddie Kingston, and Penta. God damn it, okay, I didn't think you'd be able to do it. But you realize that since those teams were just put together, literally, last Wednesday night was when uh, Santana and Ortiz came out and re-debuted, right? Yeah. So the point is, think about this. 
you're in an 80,000 seat building with 80,000 people and here comes a 10 man tag team match and the teams were just announced three or four days ago and some of these people are people that have not even been seen on television through injury or dispute or whatever in a year now and they're all fighting at the same time in various places in the building who the fuck could keep track of who was on what team and who was winning and who was losing at any given point in that stadium. I mean, it was a train wreck of a match. It was hard could to follow. You, but I mean, if you were just watching, could you instantly remember, oh, wait a minute, that guy's on the other team and his guy's on this team and his guy's... And they changed it within the last week to fucking add these other people that ran in and did this and surprise announcements. It was a goddamn mess. From the start, you've got a garbage outlaw mud show indie wrestling match with preliminary talent in a on a giant stadium show like that where nobody even knows who's on whose side. It was fucking ridiculous. And again, this was every outlaw indie wrestler's jack-off session to do all of this stuff in front of a big crowd. And the plumber was bleeding two minutes in. And there were camera shots being missed all over the place because it was such a mess. Nobody knew, nobody could agent this. There was nobody telling the director, oh, make sure you go to camera six. They're about to do this intricate spot. It was just a fucking a mess. And then... Then they have a split screen at one point because there's guys fighting out in the hallway while other people are still in the ring and or in the stadium. And then the fucking plumber pulls out the skewers, whether they're the shish kebab skewers or the whatever the fuck they're for, shrimp on the barbie. Chicken satay. And, uh, and the other knucklehead drills them into Moxley's head. And he's sitting there in front of all those people with shit stuck in his head for real. What a, a, a gimmick aside, wrestling business aside, what a fucking stupid garbage human being that he must be. Because I've never had the displeasure of running across him. And, I, and certainly there's no reason to start now. But can you imagine having 80,000 people, the record crowd in all of wrestling and the grandioseness that that takes in and showing them piss poor pretend talent in a garbage mud show match like this. And some were in the ring and some were in the back of the Royal box and they had chairs and ladders in the ring. And I started fast forwarding and Pockets was bleeding and Trent was bleeding. You know, that's a big fucking deal for the, oh, I'm not only going to wrestle in front of 80,000 people, but they're going to let me cut my head too. And none of this could possibly ever lead to any money being drawn or it was completely embarrassing. And then here comes Trent's mother's minivan. And she's in it. Did they did they find a lookalike minivan or did they carry that son of a bitch across the ocean for this fucking unfunny comedy? There's no way they did that. I can't. I mean, Tony they, would do they, it, they, but they, I can't they, imagine. No way. Hey, they if I, <laughs> they carried the old battleship across the ocean, Trent's mom, they could have carried her old car over as well. And she handed them pie plates and cookie sheets with cookies on them to use to hit the heels. This is where we're at with these supposed grown adults. And then music played, and Penthouse, who apparently had been sidelined earlier and I missed it, came out wearing a different color gear. And, I, and then they, he took with Santana a bump off of a ladder through a table on the stage. And I said, fuck, where's the finish? I can't take this. I skipped some more shit. I came back. Pockets had gotten a bucket and a bottle and broke the bottle, put the glass in the bucket, wrapped duct tape around his fist with the sticky part 
outwards, which the the fucking idiot announcer that used to do this on VHS from his basement that's now been propped up on a platform like this was telling probably some normal people might have accidentally been watching this. And he was actually telling, well, the reason why he's doing that is because the sticky parts on the outside. So then he stuck his hand in the fucking bucket of glass to make a super glass fist to fuck these. It's like, this is supposed to be the generation of wrestlers. That's not on drugs. Is that why the ones from my generation behaved normally like logical human beings because they were on drugs? Is this what the human mind comes up with when they're it's totally straight? Because these people are fucking morons. So as he's got the super glass fist, Claudio and the plumber stopped him but Kingston beat Claudio up with a chair and then speared the plumber through the table and then Pockets hit Claudio with the super glass fist. One, two, three. So you now have a situation that was created where the mascot pinned one of the more talented guys in the company who's hidden in this dreck by hitting him with a glass or by hitting him with a Superman punch with broken glass duct tape to his fist. This looked like what Ian Rotten would have done if somebody had given him money. The glass is what he did. That's what he did in ECW with Axel. Oh, the good type God. A death match, wasn't that it? That's right. I was talking about the overall, the furniture and the, the stupidity of all of it. The idiocy, the garbage people in a garbage match. 20 minutes of indie-minded marks playing with their own dicks in front of all of us, and we had to watch it. They would be ashamed of themselves, but they think they did something good. I would never have become a wrestling fan if shit like this was allowed, so fake and so stupid. Even at 12 years old, I would have never become a wrestling fan if they let anybody in the business at that point do anything like this. And this is probably the biggest reason why wrestling is a niche product now and is probably going to stay that way because you've got a bunch of fucking garbage idiots like this poisoning their own well. Do you, so think, you, do you, think, the, do you think the skewer spot only works on wrestlers losing their hair? Can you do that on a wrestler with a full head of hair to get the full impact? Well, you know, it, it seems counterintuitive because... Moxley's the biggest shithead I know, and usually shit grows where there's manure around. But in this case, his head's completely barren, not only of hair, but of intellectual thought or cognitive ability. What do you think? Do you think they gave him the electroshock when he was in therapy? I think Moxley has a fetish for what was CZW, what is GCW, what is Nick Gage, this... You know, whatever you want to call it, just dirty. Then why don't they bring out the chicken and let him bite the head off and and spit the blood? Maybe and, he will. Maybe he will. And and then the, if, if whoever's the Rob Zombie that remakes all the horror movies, he can remake Freaks, and Moxley can be the fucking thing in the box at the end with the feathers. Moxley continues to be an embarrassing guy to have. As a professional wrestler, his matches are terrible, whether they have garbage stuff or not. His instincts are clearly horrible. Worst wrestler in the business today. Well, they gave him what he wanted, which was to go out there and get stuck and cut and pretend to be a bad guy. And after that match, I took a break on watching this show. I said, I come back. I went and did some laundry, do something enjoyable. And then I came back. And I pressed play and found that it was the women's four-way title match, and I was not going to start back on any kind of rotten four-way. Soraya had a great entrance. Uh, Tony loves to pay for the music. And, you know, we will rock you. And she came out with her family on stage. And that's where I determined that the, how do they phrase it, the least good woman in the match is probably going to win. 
It was Tony Storm versus Britt Baker versus Sheeta versus Soraya. I think nobody's going to question that out of those four, Soraya is the one you would least want to see wrestle. And But she's the hometown hero, so she won it. But now, Brian, tell me, did I miss, because I didn't care and I skipped, or did they ever explain Tony Storm and Soraya have been in the same group? They were the outcasts or the misfits or the outsiders or the NWO or whatever the fuck they were. And they've been painting the other, other girls green, indicating that they were losers, painting the green L on them. But to win this match, Soraya, the, the home country hero who's been a heel on the television program, sprayed the other heel, Tony Storm, her ex-partner, in the face with the can of spray paint and then hit a sloppy finish and won one, two, three. Did, why did they split? Was, it, was that it? Were they For mad the at each other from previously? For the title, that's why. Was that the split? To be the champion, wouldn't that they, cause a split? But I mean, were they mad at each other earlier in the match that I skipped? Or I was that I don't just, think so. I don't think so, no. So the first we heard of any dissension, maybe, maybe if there's anybody out there in the cult of Cornette, and I doubt this very much, who gives two tickled shits about the women's division in AEW, have they been teasing issues between Soraya and Tony Storm? Or did she just decide to blind her with the spray paint at the finish of this match? Yeah, I think that was it. Tony Storm's been doing these solo promos, which have been the best thing she's ever done. And technically, she's still with them. I guess this is a way to get her out of that. Well, I guess she's out now. Soraya got the big hometown pop. That's what they were looking for. That's what we said that we thought the finish could be for that reason. But it says a lot about what's going on with the AEW women's division. There's some talent there. When I say talent there, People that would work in WWE. But there was one women's match on this pay-per-view. And it was in the death spot after that stadium stampede. And it was all about just getting a big hometown pop. Which hopefully would cause people to overlook the fact that it was a sloppy mess. One would think if Soraya was going to be victorious and become the women's champion in front of 80,000 screaming, adoring fans, they might have bothered to switch her baby face on the TV first so that it would... Translate to some business over here. Well, they didn't seem like they want that. It seemed like they wanted her to be a babyface there and still be a heel over here. That's what it sounded like at the press scrum afterwards. Um, yeah. But look, Soraya's not that She's great. She's not good. Not good. Britt Baker ain't that much better. She's not good. Britt not Baker's good. really not good. Tony Storm's good. Tony Storm's good. You look at Tony Storm and you could picture her, you know, with a different hairdo. <laughs> I looked at Tony Storm and pictured her. You could picture her with a different hairdo in almost any period of time with women's wrestling. Like she, and she's really good and she could do promos. The problem is there's no division. The problem is that division's filled with people that are not ready for prime time. You know what the problem is? There's too much division in the division. They need Jane Cargill back. You, <sighs> if, boy. if, if her rich husband ever goes broke and she needs the money, they could bring her back. See, at least she was presented like a star and treated like a star and started to believe she was that star. Yeah, and then believed she was a star that did one job and left the business forever. But seriously, look at the women's division. Collision, they've been treating Willow and Chris Statlander seriously. The AEW Women's Championship death spot. I mean, do you agree this is the death spot after that oh, boxing yeah. match? After, the, after Moxley normally, but especially in that instance, nobody wanted to see any more wrestling. Yeah, so, you know, it says a lot about the AEW women's division right now. All righty, well, speaking of seeing some more wrestling, the next match on the card was the coffin match with Swerve. And this was the one that was changed because of the flip-floppery of A.R. Fox and et cetera, but it, this, it ended up being Swerve Strickland and Christian Cage against Darby Allin and Sting in a coffin match where the only way to win is to put one of your opponents in the uh, coffin at ringside and close the lid. And obviously, as a byproduct of that, anything goes. Lazy booking. But I swear to God, are the, the two guys that came out rapping for Swerve, Brian, you may know this. Obviously, you know I wouldn't. 
Are they just like his friends that came with him? Were they supposed to be someone, stars of some description? And were we supposed to know who they were, or was it supposed to get heat on the heel because he's got his friends wrapping him to the ring and making a big deal out of it? And was this good in any way? I personally did not think of this was good. Not to say that they aren't good rappers, but this specific, or he wasn't a good rapper, but this specific performance. Well, there was two of them. There was two guys. No, it was one guy rapping. The other guy was DJ Who Kid or whatever his name was. Well, didn't he? He was there. He didn't rap. You didn't see him with a microphone. Well, then what was he there for? He kind of danced. He's there as part of the show. Well, he's there he's to all right, then he was lend support. The other guy was rapping. So there was one rapper, and Swerve raps, but he wasn't rapping. It was a way to give Swerve a big entrance. And, uh, yeah. Are they somebody? Should we know who the fuck they were? Everybody's, were they... everybody's somebody. Sometime. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dino. <laughs> And then Darby and Sting, they did an entrance video where they were wandering the streets. I said, my God, they're wandering the streets of Whitechapel. And I'll be a son of a bitch. Wouldn't you know who won the pony when the announcers talked about it? They said, well, everybody saw Sting and Darby on the streets of Whitechapel. I get Darby would have probably got ripped by Jack, but he had his big brother with him. Uh, Sting did an English accent. That was kind of interesting. Someone sent us an email. I don't have their name in front of me, and I apologize, but they said... When Sting wrestles, he's dressed like a woman wrestling in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He could have some kind of goddamn major skin condition, and we wouldn't know. Because he's covered from neck to toe, and he's got makeup on every yeah. part of his face. Is he wearing gloves? I think he wears gloves, doesn't he? Does he have a body cast? I don't know what's going on. There could be. He Maybe he's not in there. <laughs> maybe he's not even in there. No wonder he's not killed himself by now doing all this stuff. He's not even really in there. This is our stunt sting. Um, our, apparently the coffin match, because I'm used to the Undertakers. I've been involved in those. Those were singles. The tag team coffin match, also, it's not a taggy. That's all four. Anything goes. Everywhere, blah, blah, blah. Sting beat up everybody with a black cricket bat. Uh, then they put on thumbtack-covered jackets and splashed the heels in the corners with them. That was my favorite because Darby takes out Sting's jacket. He has to show, he's like, Sting, the jacket. <laughs> and he holds it up for Sting. <laughs> I just, uh, again, I think if you, if you wear a thumbtack-covered jacket, you are automatically someone that I don't want to have any association with. Just if you have one. You're a fucking moron. Suzanne, throw, um, throw away the coat. Throw away the coat. <laughs> Is this so my then, Yes, yes. The heel stopped the baby faces and took the jackets off. And then Christian duct taped Darby's hands behind him. But Darby started doing, he did a no hands moonsault on Christian and a no hands diving cannonball to the floor on Swerve. And I would be thinking, you know, even if this motherfucker doesn't care whether he breaks his own neck or not, I'm not letting a guy, even if he's only 125 pounds, dive on me or at me with his hands tied behind his back. It's just, it's ridiculous. And Christian did the best job he could, and best job probably of anybody on the roster regularly, of being in one of those things, and he still didn't do anything stupid or get anything on him, really. It, you know, he somehow can still be a professional in the middle of all of this. And Sting then comes off the apron onto Swerve is leaning over the middle of the table. And they're trying to give Sting a spot where he does stuff to get a pop, but at the same time, they don't want him to hurt himself. So Sting is going to dive off the apron and Splash swerves back, and Swerve's going to go through the table. But since he's just coming off the apron, and Swerve was already kind of laying on it, and the way he hit, again, it didn't break. Because it needs to be more force than that, even on those flimsy tables. So then Sting, trooper that he is, gets back up in the ring, steps out, and leg drops swerve and goes through the table that time but then swerve is going face first through the fucking table to a concrete floor with a guy 
230 pounds or whatever Sting is now under that outfit, sitting on his back. I don't, why do they have to do this? It doesn't have anything to do with wrestling. It just, it, it, you roll your eyes because it's constant. Why do I want to see the same fucking thing all the goddamn time? Then they got Christian almost in, but Dino Douche came out and he just beat Darby Allen up, even though he's not in the match. And it's not like interference of the heels of days gone by. It's people just come out and get involved in the match. Well, it's no DQ. So that means you're a fucking bad fucking booker, or a bad fucking producer, or a bad agent, or a bad wrestler. You can't figure out any other way to do it. And then here comes fucking Nick Wayne and hits the dinosaur with a skateboard and the dinosaur doesn't sell it and just knocks Nick out and choke slams him on the floor on the skateboard. So again, this 19-year-old kid or 18 or whatever the fuck he is is going to demolish his goddamn discs in his back for stupid bumps that nobody's going to remember tomorrow. You know the only reason they're remembering it? Because I'm talking about it now, Nick. It's the only reason. As soon as I stop, they're going to forget. So you're a fucking moron. The crowd was silent as Dino carried Nick Wayne out of the arena. And then Sting beat up Swerve and Christian. And Darby coffin dropped off the top rope onto the coffin because Swerve moved. And then I wrote, why am I still making notes like this is a real match? So jumping ahead, uh, basically Swerve double stomp Sting off the top. They put the coffin in the ring. Swerve tried to put Sting in the coffin, but Sting blocked it. Swerve slammed Sting on the coffin and went to the top and did a 450 onto the coffin because Sting moved. And then Sting gave Swerve a scorpion death drop on the coffin and put him in it, but couldn't close it. And then Darby Allen coffin dropped the coffin, even though he had just done that and missed and fucking hurt himself minutes before. He co double, he coffin dropped the coffin with Swerve caught in the middle of the coffin. And then they closed it. Thank fucking God. Swerve's hair was not all the way in the coffin. I don't think he technically should have lost. I think the losers were everybody involved in this match and the people that had to watch it. Is If this is what wrestling is, then stop calling it wrestling. Just talk about, you know, here's our all elite stunt fighting and put guys in different settings every week and let them have stupid silly fake looking fucking fights in front of in different settings maybe they'll be in an ice cream shop next week the fuck is this it's a coffin match any closing thoughts not really again right. it was like two shows up to this point it was not that everything was perfect but the show up to the point jim ross left and then it just became like Garbage Unlimited. Well, we're getting back to the wrestling now. Because it's time for Chris Jericho. <laughs> Did you ever think you'd hear that? Getting back to a normal wrestling match. Time for Chris Jericho. And uh, we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the match, but let's talk about the entrance. Um, I think he was trying to be Freddie Mercury at Live Aid. Yeah. But he sounded more like Harry Belafonte in Deo. He sounded more like Harry Belafonte now. He just passed away a few months ago. Yes, yes. I work on Banana Boat all night long. Daylight come and I want to go home. Deo, Deo. He was trying to get the people to ole, 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 ole with him. It was really, really sad and pathetic. You need, you need to be a vocalist of some renown to do that for people at a any type of public gathering, don't you? Someone that he cares about, who loves him, needs to have the guts to tell him he can't sing. He can't sing. He can't sing. He can only sing if there's a backing track of him with auto-tune singing well, whatever he's singing. 
I was about to say, at least he didn't try to sing here, but you could say that the call and response, as they used to call it down in the the African-American churches that spawned rhythm and blues, the call and response, his call was pretty fucking weak. Even though they were trying to respond to him, but it wasn't Freddie Mercury going, ole, 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 whatever the fuck he was doing. That was really lame. And then the band started. And then the band started. And then... Brian, again, I defer to your experience in the music industry. I've been to a number of concerts. I've, you know, been involved with some of the musical performances that have been involved in wrestling programming. But was this a case where he knew that he could not sing the song and fully perform it while walking to the ring in a stadium at the same time and then having a match with a guy 30 years younger than he is, or elsewise he'd blow up to the first five rows were passing out from oxygen deprivation just from him sucking wind. So did he record a track of him kind of half-talking the words to Judas so that he could then lip-sync his way to the ring over a track of him not singing, because that would be obvious, but just kind of halfway talk walking. No, I think it was the regular Judas track with him singing over it or trying to sing over it. Then if he was out of breath walking to the ring doing it, can you imagine him on stage with his funky dance moves? But that's it. There was no element of even attempting to sing live. He was talking live. That's what Sebastian Bach always said, that Jericho needed a backing track he can't sing. It didn't even seem like the backing track was as as energetic as the normal song performance is. So I would, but you could see a couple of times that, like the way he had a live mic because when he tried to do the rock and roll ow type of thing, you could tell he forgot that there was another word coming and he was completely off microphone but still singing. So you could tell there was a backing track going on, and a couple times he was late getting to it. But God, I was like, he there was no, he was just talking like he was doing a promo while he was walking to the ring. I was expecting a performance of the song, and then potentially a period of time where they could, I don't know, golf cart him to the ring or something where he could catch his breath. But he just did the first stanza as they say and the chorus and didn't even milk the people to sing it afterwards so he wanted to get that over with while he still had oxygen and there were not only were there no close-ups the camera stayed off of him singing completely and it was all crowd shots after the first couple of bobbles did you see that yeah i mean there's only so so much pantomiming jericho you could take Well, but I'm just, uh, I would have thought they would have done that a little bit since they made a big deal out of announcing it. I would have thought they would have orchestrated that all a little bit more uh, poshly, a little bit more pomp and circumstance to everything, but they just got it over with. They sure didn't get the, the match over with. The match took a while, but in all honesty, Jericho was working his ass off. He tried he did. This was one of the better single performances he's had in a while. He wanted to do everything he used to be able to do. He did some of it. it, it next to the rest of the, the card, this was, you know, at least a reputable professional match. Ostrich looks like Action Andretti's big brother, doesn't he? No, I think it's just a haircut. I think, no, I'd say there's a body style and everything. He's his big brother. And again, they have the dynamic where this time they literally just switched Chris Jericho babyface on the heel manager, Don Fallis, that is accompanying Will Ostrich to the ring. But Will's a home, home country hero again. So they're cheering the heel with the evil, despicable manager against the guy that just turned babyface in a big angle on television two weeks ago. So once again, interesting reactions here. Aubrey Ed was the referee for this. I noted that her energy seemed to be unbridled in front of this crowd. 
Did you notice on the fake forearm exchange that they started with that when Osprey hit the chop, Jericho sold it big, dropped to his knees, peeled his blade off his wrist, and then as the camera got a close-up of Ostrich, <laughs> Jericho bladed his chest for the chop. Remember he did that? Who was that for here yeah, a while Yeah, when back. did he do that? He did do that before, didn't he? He did it on television, but this time he did it weekly because there, there was almost no blood, even though the announcers pointed it out shortly after that, but you could see scratches. What, did Ostrich open him up with his fingernails? That's the thing. You can't, you can't blade your chest for chops with Gunther or so hey you know who he bladed it for the japanese guy that does all the chops if it's gunther with those heavy hands and you're going to commit to it and blade it and you've got a decent amount of blood on your chest that's one thing before jericho went too far and he was bleeding like a stuck hog from chops which wouldn't but this was you it was so little blood you could see the the scratch mark that he obviously made himself and then Jericho German ostrich on the apron, uh, w right on the top of his head. And there were, they would each make comebacks, but you're not sure who the babyface is. Again, Jericho was working hard. Ostrich, to me, relies too much on the, I'm going to flip and land on my feet quickly, and people are going to be surprised. But then finally... Sammy was out there, and did you see the spot where Jericho gets the walls of Jericho, and behind the referee's back, he's the referee. He, she is dealing with Don. Sammy hit Ostrich in the head with the baseball bat, and within seconds later, Ostrich is escaping from the hold. So it would just, I'll just hit him in the head with a bat for no good reason. Anyway, it kept going, and uh, again, I noted props to Jericho for trying this hard. Jericho kicked Ostrich in the balls and hit the Judas and got a two count. And then Ostrich did all kind of shit and hit some of it and got a two count and then hit more shit and got a three count. So they went, to the, Jericho put him over. It was the right finish for this, again, for this show, this building, this country. Um, and they're still of the opinion that the best way to build a wrestling finish is to do every move to a guy that you can figure out to do until you've done them all and then do one or two more and then pin him. And there it was. What'd you think of your boy Jericho? I thought it was the best Jericho match in a while. I think Don Callis being involved in this match made no sense. Will Ospreay was going to be the babyface because of the circumstances. And he's really good. I like Will Ospreay. Will Ospreay came out. Callis was like 50 feet behind him. Like they didn't walk out like a guy with his manager next to him or right behind him. Callis was nowhere near him. And it threw into play just this weird dynamic. It was a good match. But Jericho had to be the heel. He had to be the heel. I mean, there was no other solution here good match osprey just did an interview where he talked about the upcoming bidding for him which is a little weird because that's mjf's gimmick osprey would be a good get for AEW. i like osprey well they've already got him he's already gotten got well no he's there for this but technically i think he's still a new japan wrestler well why buy the cow when you could get the milk for free who's the cow in this situation well, that's it may be utterly ridiculous to you, but I think it's ostrich. Okay. I, th I didn't know if New Japan was the cow. That's why an ostrich no, was the it, milk. You know, well, uh, ostrich, you, it depends on, you know, which direction you want to milk him. Anyway, let's not talk anymore about <laughs> milk and poor Will because he's probably drained dry at this point. Uh, that's when Nigel came out and announced the the new record attendance, eighty one zero three five. Remember that. And now every record that the WWF announces from here on out is going to blow that out of the water. And even though it's not 
legitimate, people are going to believe it. That'll be interesting to see if that causes AEW fans to want to support them more if they know that WWE is now intentionally trying to run shows just so they could beat that number. It could potentially cause more fans to want to show W just like the original. Well, but they're not, but they're not. They're running shows that can beat that number, whether they beat that number or not. But they haven't. They're just, they're going to, the next goddamn time they run a stadium, they'll beat that number. The next time they're going to announce they beat that number, whether they yeah. did or didn't is the question. But the, well, the thing is, if everybody believes it and what difference does it make? That's true. 93,173. 90, 93, <laughs> <right. laughs> so, anyway, for the six man tag team title, the House of Blick uh, versus the acclaimed and Billy Gunn. And as we mentioned, uh, this whole angle has been not to get the acclaimed out on their own, but to bring Billy back to save them. And they got into an immediate six-way, and they jumped down, started fighting on the floor. The one thing I liked, this was pay-per-view, and they're in England, where apparently they have a little bit better tolerance of things like this. So they did the big leg drop to Julia Hart right in her crotch. They'd never they, be able to get away with that here. And this sounds crazy, but I was thinking and watching it, because you can't believe that anyone would do that nowadays just because of the reaction you anticipate. Would they have done this with any other wrestler other than Bowens? Because Bowens established that he's not into women. So it's not like a threatening domestic violence kind wait, of situation. Wait, I don't care if you're wait, I don't care if you're straight, gay, bi, trans, animal, vegetable, or mineral. If you jump off the top rope, I'm not justifying it. leg in somebody's crotch, that's a bit aggressive. I agree. But do you think AEW would only do this with Bowens? I never even thought about that. I just figure because it's on pay-per-view, they can't get kicked off of television. And it's not like something that you would I've do. I've not heard but, one complaint about it. No, there wasn't, but the people cheered. And there, and also, it's not like something you can do in a domestic altercation. Have you ever heard about a guy beating his wife by jumping off the dresser in the bedroom and dropping a leg on her crotch? Jimmy Snuka. Maybe once. And then, and then if Bowens is gay, well, there you go. There's a, some kind of... Some kind of, I don't know, fucking energy that indicates that it's not male-on-female violence if it's a female heel manager and a gay male baby face. Somehow the, the fucking chemistry works out. But anyway, Jew, you got to take a little bump there. What'd you think of the fact the House of Black were wearing all white? Well, that was a little disorienting. I thought maybe I'd, I'd, I needed the color bars to come back up. I'd set my hues wrong. All right, so back to this. Yes, the House of Black and White. Maybe they should be the House of Black and White. And they could come out with rabbit ears on, like the old days. They were all dressed in white. Knights in white satin. Maybe they could be that. Uh, and they never reached the end of this match. Uh, the heels just beat the shit out of the baby faces. By the way, this was all six guys in the ring at the same time the whole match. Again. No holds barred. House rules. No holes barred. Anything goes. No DQ. Lazy booking. So, again, wait a minute. Let's go back. We had a real match on first, Joe and Punk. Then the six man didn't have special rules, but they just acted like it. Uh, the tag team match didn't have special rules, thank goodness. And then we had football field fuckery. And then we had a four-way women's match, and then we had the coffin match, anything goes, and then we have Jericho and Ostrich, which had rules, but then right back away from the rules with the no-rules six-man, and it was in and out of the ring at the same time, and chairs, and etc., and then they hit Brody King with about 18 moves, and all three of them covered him, and the referee counted it, one, two, three, and we've got new champions. So now, except for the Bullet Club, the House of Black were the top heels on Saturday night, and they've just gotten beaten by the acclaimed and their senior citizen sidekick that is actually the toughest guy on the roster. And the House of Black handed over the belts and walked out. That's what happened there. So now what are the acclaimed and Billy going to do? Because there's so many trios teams lined up to face them. 
I don't know. And again, House of Black wore all white, a typical babyface move, and then they handed over the belts with no problem and walked off. Let's see what they do, but... But now, wait wait a minute, they can't be switching babyface, because then they'd have to let Julia Hart go back to, to grade school. They've obviously Why? They've kidnapped her. No, I don't think so. I think she enjoys They're holding her them. against her will. Are you saying this is like a Symbionese Liberation Army thing with Tanya, Patty Hearst? No, that's what you're saying. I'm not saying that completely. I, th- I think, uh, I think she's, she needs to have a stricter talk with them. I think the evil needs to flow from her. Because the rest of them are just kind of hanging around. That's why I like the acclaimed rap so good on Collision. They really made fun of the House of Black, like, perfectly. Pointed out all their weaknesses. (laughs) 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 Oh, if we only had time to point out everybody's weaknesses. Well, it was a lot of time on this show. Again, I actually missed a little bit of this match because I needed a break. A long day of wrestling. Again, I watched the pre-show. You didn't. I got to see the MJF Adam Cole tag match. Oh, I, I went. I went back and and uh, and viewed that match and the the Perry incident on the pre-show, which was the pre-show was two as it was zero hour, but the clip that I saw on the internet was two hours long. So they had a two hour zero <laughs> hour followed by four hours of this pay per view. I got zero hour an hour before the pay per view began which is when I think they announced it. And that's when the tag title match was and the Jack Perry match would hook. I which, ordered the pay-per-view on real television and didn't get dick all of the zero hour. It started right with the pay-per-view. Well, it began with them basically saying, we've already had an hour of action here. Like, what? What are you talking about? Apparently they did some kind of thing that didn't air on any of this with a big show <laughs> and Anthony Agogo <laughs> took on Jeff Jarrett and Satnam Singh and Jay Lethal and beat them all up. I wonder if they just got to Wembley Stadium about six o'clock in the morning and just did some matches just for themselves. The ring just is here. Do it. Let's do it. The ring is set up. Let's get out there and just start the show. Well, but they finished the show with the biggest money match of uh, the the match that drew the biggest paid attendance of all time. Not, as I said before, Londos and Lewis or Gotch and Hack and Schmidt or Thez and Leone, or Rogers and O'Connor, or even Rock and Austin. As much as we like both of them at various points, and sometimes as much as we get disappointed in them at various points, Adam Cole and MJF, main event, on the biggest show of all time. Although, again, main event on the biggest show of all time is different than drawing the gate. Well, I was about to say 75 of the 80,000 tickets were sold before we knew the match was going to take place, but let's not let details get in the way of everybody's enjoyment. Again, I like, you know, the entrance is, with MJF being an obnoxious, egotistical, self-centered type of fellow, I like the entrance with the ominous music and being carried to the ring on the platform and the devil mask and the maidens bowing to him and everything. It's just that it was a lot cooler when he was doing that and people were doing that and bowing to him when he wasn't on TV every week, you know, at at Chuck E. Cheese playing dodgeball with six-year-olds and telling Adam Cole how how much he in, it loves him as a friend and all that stuff. It, it's not the same devil anymore, is it? I don't... <laughs> it's the babyface devil. That's what it is. I think right now uh, MJF is clearly a babyface, and based on what we saw here, possibly the biggest babyface in the whole company. Yeah. I mean, the field is wide open when you think about it. Who gets major reactions? Punk? MJF? And occasionally, you know, other. I'm not talking about at the end. I'm talking about when you see them. Yeah. Omega gets that reaction, to be fair. Uh, right. But they don't use him to capitalize on that, whether it's because he can't physically or because they just don't. Who knows? But MJF right now is the biggest baby face. And I heard from people in the building, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from listeners there. A lot of people wearing Cornette face T-shirts in attendance, apparently. But they say that the crowd was totally into MJF and Adam Cole. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, you could tell even on on the broadcast, much less being there live and the signs, a guy had a sign, he's my scumbag. And this was, 
These guys are both talented. Adam Cole has a very expressive face, especially when he's got the face of like something's bullshit or he's surprised or shocked or you can't, you can't be serious face. And they both got good heads on their shoulders. And this was a, a chance for normally you would want the storytelling, the psychology, the drama, but you'd also want, you know, the match, you know, the, the old flare steamboat equation. Is it, it's as entertaining as sport can possibly be while not being phony, but it's also as sports-like as entertainment can possibly be. You, you try to go for that, that balance. But when the rest of the, almost the rest of the show was just chaos involving indie-minded, you know, moderate-level talents, they just said, fuck it, we're going to do a goddamn a pantomime piece here. This was all drama. It was all built to confuse them. I mean, there were wrestling moves and, and instances thrown in, but it was all about playing with people's emotions and who should I be behind or who might be the one turning or what's going on. And because it was so different, normally this might have been too much drama, too much inside the actor's studio, but with the rest of the show, I think it was kind of perfect that they just did this. There was still all kinds of wrestling moves, but it was it was the drama and the gaga and the interplay between the two of them. Will he or won't he? Is he or is he not? And that was pretty much the story of the whole thing, and the people were, after all those hours, they sat there watching all this other shit, they still wanted to fucking see it. And they were still into it. And MJF gets the people to chant sportsmanship. Sport and then pokes Adam Cole in the eye. But then later on, Adam Cole steals the eye. But Adam Cole nominally, one would think, be the baby face of the equation, is the heel, because as you said, MJF, the people are so enamored of him that they're cheering everything he does because he's so fucking entertaining. And, you know, whether they're coaxing, you know, the, the people to coax MJF to dive or not to dive or whatever. Um, and, and the mind games they're playing where later on in the match, they're both fighting on the desk and MJF goes for a tombstone, but can't do it. And he puts Adam Cole down because he just doesn't want to tombstone him. And then Adam picks him up and hits the tombstone on the desk. Well, see there, no good deed goes unpunished. And, you know, it, again, that was pretty much the, the story of the match is teasing people what they're going to do. And then finally, they were so spent, they were doing the yay boo on their knees, then they got up and they traded and then a Canadian destroyer and a big kick and both of them were down and both of them get up and call double clothesline and hit that. And as soon as they both go down on top of each other, hit it on each other, just for the record. Well, yeah, because, they yeah. did it on each other, double clothesline. That spot they were trying to fucking tell, you know, the people had been wanting to see the double clothesline. Cause by the way, I don't even think we said, yes, they beat, Ozzy Oldham for the Ring of Honor World Tag Title in the Zero Hour match. But the referee immediately went down, didn't waver, didn't look like, oh my God, what should I do? I've never dreamed this would happen. He just went down and immediately counted it. And so the fans booed it, and the referee called for a draw, and the fans booed more, but you could tell where they were going because it was way too quick. I don't know, maybe some fans thought, oh, they're going to fuck us like this. But if when they had done that, if the referee had gone down, and or not even gone down, but just looked at it for a second and go like, oh shit, wait, they're cut. What should I? I I don't know what else to do. Okay, then done it. You might have you might have set the hook in their mouth a little better. But then Adam asks for five more minutes, and MJF says no. Five minutes isn't enough. We're going till we got a winner in fucking Wembley. Motherfucker. Fuck.
No, they had to say fuck on pay per view. And then we're off again. And did as you, soon as did they boost the mics when MJF started talking more? Probably. The, it felt like it got a lot louder. Yeah. Yes. Probably did because they didn't want to miss that. And then immediately they wipe out the referee. And so MJF sees there's no referee and he goes and gets a chair. But then he's going to do the Eddie Guerrero thing where he throws the chair to Adam, but Adam Cole throws it back at him and they keep tossing the chair back and forth. It's like duck season, rabbit season, duck season, rabbit season. And finally, Adam falls down like he got hit with it. So said MJF says, fuck it. He puts the chair over his own head and lays down. And I mean, this is, again, can you imagine Austin and Rock having done this? No. But for the fact that they've I seen... I could see The Rock doing it, not Austin. Well, yeah, but I mean, in, in the middle of a WrestleMania main event, it was a little much. But again, finally the referee gets up and MJF takes back over. And then they go to the apron, but Adam's German suplexes MJF on the apron. Turn about his fair play. And the Panama Sunrise off the apron onto MJF onto the floor and then rolls MJF in two count. That's a bit much. I know they're not all high risk guys here, especially MJF, but goddamn. So then, as Adam Cole tries the Panama Sunrise in the ring, MJF pulls the referee into it and the referee gets Panama Sunrise. That's where Adam Cole looks like he just seen a fucking space alien. What do you think of that spot of doing that? The idea that the referee would be there and Adam Cole would be able to just hit that move of all moves to the guy it, that was just again, shoved into place. A lot of showbiz in this match. And it was working because of the personalities and because they've been waiting to see something that meant something besides just this constant interchangeable chaos. So they're telling a story, even though if it's a phony story. Uh, MJF puts the diamond ring on, but he's conflicted and he takes it off and puts it away. But as he does that, Roddy comes in, Roderick Strong and kicks MJF in the balls and then jumps out. Well, then Adam sees Roddy. I don't know if he saw the ball kick, but see, or, or after seeing Roddy, he still hits the Panama sunrise and the knee on MJF. But when he covers him, there's no referee. And so there's a delay, but finally, referee comes up, one, two, MJF kicks out, there's a big pop. Now Roddy throws the belt, the title belt, to Adam Cole, but Adam Cole is conflicted. And he throws the belt down, and Roddy stalks off because he's pissed. And Adam Cole turns to MJF, and MJF small packages him, one, two, three. Ding, ding, ding. And that was it. And I wrote exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point, question mark. Uh, and then MJF consoled Adam Cole because now Adam's in the corner with mad boo-boo face on and, and I, you know, like I lost it, I blew it. And MJF is getting the people to cheer for him. And he said, look, look, buddy, look, buddy. And he goes out and gets the Ring of Honor belts. We still got these. And Adam grabs the Ring of Honor belts and throws them down on the ground. And the people get hot. They're like, ooh. And then MJF gets mad. He says, so you never gave a shit about me? It was just the belt, right? Well, fuck it then. And he gives Cole the belt and turns his back on Adam Cole. And Roddy comes out and tells Cole, do it, do it. And Adam throws the belt down, and then Adam and MJF hug, and Roddy disappears again, and they celebrate. And we're back where we fucking were. Well, how did you feel about the revelation or lack thereof of anything going on here that we talked about? Did they have to extend it because the ratings had been so fantastic over it but how do all those people feel or all the people are on tv that are going to watch the highlights this coming week when nothing happened i think the people will be happy 
It's just like the bloodline. Who cares about the match? They wanted the hug. They got the hug. I think. God, why didn't I get in the wrestling business when it was this easy? We had to have finishes. They just need hugs. I think the fans there were into it. And, you know, we're not totally crazy about the entertainment elements that have been introduced into a lot of these things. But those fans are really into it. And the other thing is, in terms of a finish, there weren't too many options that seemed like it would be good. I mean, we talked about it. MJF could screw over Cole. Cole's an idiot. Cole screws over MJF. Now he's a complete idiot. The best option was them continuing on with getting along. Now, they, we said it. It may have been earlier this show. I don't know if it was today or another day. But they can't keep teasing the, I'm going to be mad at you. I'm going to super kick you. If they're going to turn on each other, it has to happen soon. <laughs> that shit can't continue. But otherwise, MJF's the biggest baby face in the company. And right now, depending on what happens with Punk, he may be the biggest star in the company. Well, we shall see. Well, on that topic, Jim, uh, well, I get anything else for All In? Any other comments about well, All In? Well, uh, no, you know, it, it was a bizarre main event for a world title match in a show like that, but it, it fit the unique situation, and they better be lucky. And Adam Cole did a great job, and they better consider themselves very lucky. They've got MJF to somehow make this work, because with anybody else in the wrestling business, can you see it at all? No. And again, based on what I assume are physical limitations on Adam Cole, this has all worked for the best for him, for getting him on TV in a serviceable way. He's in one of the most popular things in the company, or the most popular thing in the company. I thought Roddy would get involved. Taven and Bennett continue to amuse me as <laughs> not doing anything. They're just standing around at various points. If you didn't know who they were, would you even know who they are based on the television programming? Or are they just the two guys that stand behind Roddy and console him over this situation? Pretty much that. Pretty much that. But we have some CM Punk news. Uh-oh. A few things. A report from Nick Houseman, House of Wrestling. The headline... No one from AEW met CM Punk at Heathrow Airport. Exclusive. Before things backstage became chaotic for Punk, it sounds as if his travel also had some hiccups. Uh-oh. House of Wrestling has learned that when Punk landed at Heathrow Airport for AEW All in London on Saturday morning, no one from AEW was there to greet him. There was also no car service to take him to his hotel. <laughs> and when he texted a number he was given by AEW for the driver, it bounced back as being an invalid number. <laughs> After waiting for a while, Punk Wait, showed... They, they fly the biggest star in the company across the fucking ocean <laughs> and leave him standing at fucking Heathrow Airport with no idea where he's supposed to go or how he's supposed to fucking get there. And the contact that he's given for his alleged transportation is no good. After waiting for a while, Punk chose to buy a train ticket and find his own way to the hotel. We are told that the tube, that's the subway in England, was fairly busy at the time. <laughs> Punk got lost, and a few fans who noticed the Second City Saint helped him figure out where he was going. Oh my god. It appears that Punk got into London so close to the actual event because he had taping commitments in Atlanta on Wednesday and wanted to spend Thursday with his wife and dog Larry. Before <laughs> his wife's not named, but his dog Larry is. His <laughs> wife and his dog Larry before heading out on Friday and landing on Saturday morning. Well, so that's, that's the first the Punk report. the show. Right? Was the show Saturday? Was the show sa oh, show was Saturday? Saturday. The show was Saturday oh. uh, evening in London, afternoon here in the All East. Right. Or the West, I guess, technically. In the East! Well, that's the first report. The second report, Brian Alvarez of F4W Online and the Wrestling Observer is reporting, The belief within AEW is that Punk and Jack were both suspended pending the results of an investigation. <laughs> Which would mean neither will work all out. What? If they don't have punk it all out, can you imagine? In Chicago, they'll boo him out of the fucking building. 
What the fuck? Why would you suspend the fucking guy that's the star of the goddamn show because this small fucking insignificant numbnut brained idiot, Jack Perry, decides that he's again going to do childish shit. And when he finds out that at least some people in this business still stand up for themselves and he gets snatched and then he goes crying to somebody about it. But can nobody take their goddamn earned ass kicking anymore? Uh, what the fuck? Tell the child he shouldn't have done what he did and he's lucky punk didn't do worse. And if he don't like it, then here's your contract, Jack. Rip, rip, rip. Good luck in your future endeavors. What the fuck is difficult about that? <laughs> I have a little bit more here from Nick Houseman about the actual incident. Okay. Reports regarding the actual altercation between Punk and Perry backstage at AEW All In and the subsequent aftermath have differed, with some saying Punk initiated the confrontation and others claiming it was Perry who acted first. After asking around, here is what House of Wrestling can report. Well, and, and we know that their word is like gold. Well, we can say that Nick Houseman has been all over all this punk stuff. He's a Chicago guy, and he's been involved in all this punk stuff. So let's see what this says. From what we are told, Punk was waiting in the gorilla position before the show went live for his match against Samoa Joe when Perry entered the area and walked up to him. Punk initiated the verbal exchange between the two, asking Perry if he had something to say. And the conversation quickly escalated, leading to Perry asking Punk to do something about it. Oh my God. <laughs> this is when Punk shoved Perry. Perry responded by shoving Punk back. Oh my God. And then Punk put him in what is being described as a chokehold. We're told Punk viewed putting Perry in a chokehold as a way to neutralize the situation as he's a trained fighter and does not want to have to fight Perry. No punches were thrown, as far as we know. Punk then walked to his dressing room. But got, again, who, is, who does this little needle-dicked simpleton think he is to tell CM Punk, boy, you going to do something about it? Yeah, apparently. Why would you think he wasn't? Who's going to be intimidated by Jack fucking Perry? Well, forget about even intimidation. What big star in wrestling history, Hogan, Austin, Flair, whoever you want to name, would let one of the mid-card or undercard guys in the pre-show match live on air say shit about them right into the camera? And then, and then announce to them afterwards, oh, are you going to do something about it? Yeah. What would Hogan have done? He would have had the guy fired. That's what he would have done. Unbelievable. Uh, Punk then walked to his dressing room, got cleaned up, and spoke with AEW security. Punk, knowing the situation was not good, asked them if it would be better for everyone if he left the building, and was told that nobody was asking him to leave. But it might make things easier if he did. <laughs> Punk agreed, left the building of his own accord, walked to his hotel, and ordered Nando's for some of the talent, whom he met up with after the show. Boom, and Nando's, by the way. What a fucking meal. From what we gather, it does not sound like there's been much, if any, communication between Punk and AEW since last night. So this is a developing story, just like everything seems to be every time we record. How is this a surprise, though? I mean, just... It, Which aspect of it? Well, that you're, you're going to say something smart-ass to Punk and, and something's going to happen. How is it a surprise? The, the thing that, again, that gobsmacks me is that it's a surprise to these guys that they are getting snatched or punched or whacked with a chair or whatever's happening to them in a wrestling locker room like that. How in the world can this happen? Do you think Jack Perry's been in a lot of fights in his life? Do you think Jack Perry has had issues where something he said could cause him to get punched in the mouth and he would have to defend himself? Probably not. I would bet that that probably didn't have growing up in Beverly Hills. And maybe he has a false sense of entitlement. Obviously, he has a false sense of entitlement if he thinks he could do that against one of the top stars in the company on live TV. But that, that's what I'm saying. They're all surprised. They're all shocked when they run their fucking mouse and they stir people up. It, even if they are not aware of it, they're in the wrestling business. And in the wrestling business, it's, you know, 
reasonable regularity. Somebody's going to get mad. Somebody's going to get punched. Somebody's going to get snatched. Somebody's going to... Things happen. And I don't know why they're all so surprised over it and wringing their hands and going to lawyers and legal and human relations or human resources or whatever the fuck. Again, all it boils down to is Tony doesn't have control of his shit. And he never puts his foot down and tells his employees what they're going to do and what they're going to like and what they're not going to do. And if the boss does that, then the employee has the chance to say, okay, I guess I'm going to have to do that, or fuck you, I'll go somewhere else. And it all gets settled. Nothing gets settled here because the boys have to do it themselves. And apparently the only one that's still in the wrestling business and wants to stand up for himself is fucking punk. So he's, he's got to be the Lone Ranger. Don't run your fucking yap and won't nobody get goozled. But they can't stop the yap running. And it sounds like he had a second chance. Do you have something you <laughs> want to say? And then it, they pushed Apparently him? Apparently he yeah. did. Jeez. And, he, and, and, and here's another thing. If you're going to say shit... You can't look like Jack fucking Perry. You can't be five foot nine and 142 pounds and look puzzled all the time. You have to be ready to, you know, if the guy's going to say, well, yes, I'm going to do this and this and the other thing about it. And then here, here we go. Well, here we go. Before this becomes a six hour episode, it may already have to be split into two parts. I have to see, but that's the latest news from AEW. 